Our brief land acknowledgement, acknowledging that the lands we are on are the original homelands of the Massachusetts tribal people. They are the original inhabitants that the English invaders first encountered in what is now the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Against all odds, descendants continue to survive and retain their oral and cultural traditions. And to learn more, please visit our friends at Mass Center for Native American Awareness. Um, that is who we are. So um, uh, very briefly, <clears throat> because many of you are aware of this already, but our creativecounty.org new website is ready to rock uh, with your uh, artist profiles and organizational profiles and press releases. Uh, you can register very easily on the site. Many of you have already done so. If you offer services, please share those as well. Get your best photos ready for your profile and make sure all your social accounts are active and consistent. Uh, we are growing this audience um, over the next several months and you are part of it. This is what it looks like. This is what some of the, um, the profiles look like once they're up, they're gorgeous. Um, and the blog is here. So your press releases will be up on the blog if you send them along or any, any news that you have with an image. Um, Essex County Creates hashtag is the word or phrase that we're using for all of this consistently. So anything you post on social media that is of the creative, um, you know, in the creative realm, uh, please uh, hashtag Essex County Creates and it will come into our uh, social network. Um, and then just one very brief grant opportunity that came through yesterday from, <clears throat> from um, the um, mass development is that a new uh, open Commonwealth Places grant portal, uh, two different levels of grants, 25 to 15, 2,500 to 15,000 uh, for initial uh, project uh, development for seeding um, place-based initiatives in your communities and implementation grants from five to $50,000 to execute those projects. Um, and you nonprofits and community groups can apply for these. So I just wanted to flag that to you because it's hot off the press as of yesterday. And here we are with our special guest, Michael Bobbitt. Um, he has uh, dedicated his professional career to arts leadership. He's uh, many of you have met him so far on different, you know, Zoom activities as, as he started last year. He's a theater director, choreographer, playwright, and uh, he is our new executive director at Mass Cultural Council. And without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and let Michael talk with you. Hey, friends. Thanks, Karen, so much. Thanks, John, right. for having me here. I'm really... Am I on? Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is a really important room. So thank you for creating this room. Um, <clears throat> what a time we're living in. And if you don't mind, I'd love to pontificate with you for a minute before I talk about Mass Cultural Council's priorities. Um, I, I believe that arts is a health and human service. And what you're doing is for everyone. And therefore, we should be treated as such. Uh, and mostly because what I what artists and arts organizations and those who support artists have in their minds, their hearts and their eyes and their hands is something only a few select people have, a few chosen people, and that's the gift of imagination. Imagination is seeing the world differently. Creativity is bringing the imagination to life and art is the product of creativity and artists are the experts of imagination. There's a modern philosopher, Daniel Pink, that I like to follow. He talks about the 21st century representing the triumph of our creative right brain skills over the more procedural thinking of our left brain. Our right brain skills, our creative side, would represent a new golden age of creativity for both artists and ordinary people. He says the keys to the kingdom are changing hands. The future belongs to a very different kind of person with a very different kind of mind. That's creators and empathizers. These people, artists, inventors, designers, storytellers, big picture thinkers will now reap society's re richest rewards and share its greatest joys. He talks about the people at the forefront of the evolution of humankind, like the farmers during the agricultural age, the factory workers during the industrial age, the knowledge workers during the information age, and now during the creative and conceptual age, it will be led by empathizers and creators. What about that? 
the world's problems can be solved through creativity and artists and creators are the experts. Richard Florida said there's a whole new class of workers in the US that's 38 million strong. That's the creative class. At its core are scientists, engineers, architects, designers, educators, artists, musicians, and entertainers whose economic function is to create new ideas, new technology, and new content. Today, the creative sector of the US economy broadly defined employs more than 30% of the workforce. That's more than all of manufacturing and accounts for more than a half of all wage and salary income. That's some $2 trillion, almost as much as manufacturing and the service sectors together combined. Indeed, the United States has entered what he calls the creative age. And to stay innovative, America must continue to attract the world's sharpest minds. And to do that, it needs to invest in the further development of the creative sector. Because wherever creativity goes, by extension, wherever talent goes, innovation and economic growth are sure to follow. Plus, the world will heal from the work that you do. So I appreciate you so much. This is a rough time for arts organizations and artists. We're dealing with a pandemic, severe political unrest, and a racial reckoning. Now is the time to double down on your innovative skills and your creativity. Use those skills as you're running your businesses, either your personal business or your organization's business. It's gonna help you survive and change the world, which is your charge. Now is the time to show up at the public square to make sure your voices are being heard by those who are making decisions because decisions are made by those who are in the room. So show up at the public square. Now is the time to take care of yourself so that you have the brain space, the physical stamina, and the emotional tolerance to deal with all that you are dealing with. I hope I can support you through that. At Mass Cultural Council, we have a bunch of priorities that we're working on. Uh, presently, we're working on a lot of internal operations improvements. Those of you that applied for grants this fall um, got the chance to help us beta test our new grants management system. We're also in the midst of executing our racial equity plan, which we launched in November. It's on the website if anyone wants to see it. Uh, we soon will be starting our advocacy plan for this year's budgeting process, which will be a six to eight month process, I assume. And also, you all know that we just received $60 million from the American Rescue Plan that was um, allocated to us from the legislature. Um, on Monday, January 24th, we're going to have an open listening session and information will go out about that today. So if you're not on our social media or our listserv, please sign up for that. We'll have a room open so that you can come into the room and share with me any ideas you have about how we can spend that $60 million. It's a lot of money. It's three times what we normally have. Hopefully it will make a big difference in the cultural sector. Um, you can also submit written testimony if you can't make it. And then in the fall, we will be launching our strategic planning process, plus we'll be designing our disability equity plan and our rural equity plan. That's a lot for a relatively small agency, but I feel confident we'll get it done. And uh, again, I thank you for having me here and look forward to meeting some of you that I haven't met. And uh, thank you for, it's good to see people that I haven't seen in a while. That's it, I'll stop pontificating now. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, this is an open forum, so who has any questions or concerns for Michael? Um, he can stay with us for another 15 minutes or so, and um, this is your time. This is your time to ask what we can do regionally and um, you know, how we can best interact with what's happening at Mass Cultural and how we can help each other. Yes, Christina. Hi, I'm new here. This is my first meeting. I think I've got a, a Castle Hill Productions um, theater at Castle Hill. Um, <clears throat> I have just a very uh, logistical question. Uh, Michael, can we get a copy of your remarks? Um, could you, would you mind uh, posting that or emailing that someplace? Um, um, I would love to use some of your um, <coughs> credited, of course, um, uh, your, your phrases there it was beautiful. Yeah, I'll send that to Karen. Also, if anyone's interested, um, uh, Daniel Pink and Richard Florida, they've been speaking very well about the creative um, or conceptual age. And I think it's great intel. 
I hope I can use that as we are building our advocacy campaign for this year, but I'll send that to Karen. Okay, thank you, Michael. Yeah. Others, questions? We have such a great group here. I'll have the transcript and this recording sent out to this group as well. Yeah. Thanks, John. I have a question, which is we are uh, a region, Michael, of 34 very different and diverse communities from, um, you know, post-industrial cities to, you know, urban, rural, uh, suburban, coastal, uh, wealthy, not wealthy, um, you know, and we've been trying to build a, a better, stronger creative ecosystem here for the last four or five years with this project. <clears throat> across this region. So what is your view of how a region like this um, can strengthen everyone's ability to do their work in the creative um, world? Well, I think it's partly it's what you're doing now. I think that gathering and having conversations and creating action steps out of the conversations, uh, the sort of collective impact that you can have can have a, a huge impact on what happens at the state house, and how many laws are passed to help to help a region support each other, but also the collective impact and sharing that information with me gives me information that I can use when I go back to our council and our staff about what programs or what initiatives or where there might be some marginalization that we can correct. Um, I always tell people I can't do my job unless I hear from people. And sometimes I don't hear from enough people. Or sometimes I hear from only a few people a lot. Um, so it's important that I hear from everyone. And collectively, if you all know that there are like, here are the six problems that we have in this region, then I can do something about that usually. And then I, as I said in my speech, um, show up at the public square. I think there's so many decisions that happen and not enough people that have, not enough people are sharing their voice in the public square. If you think about way back when, when towns were built in the public square was like the state house, usually some sort of church and some sort of performance venue. And so art was always a part of social justice, always a part of how society evolved. Somehow we became on the fringes and I need us to get back into the center of society because the things that we do can help every single sector that's out there. So show up at the public square, collective impact is really strong. Mm -hmm. Hey Michael, real, real quick to expand on that a little bit. A lot of the artists that we work with, individuals, freelancers that don't ever sit at any they don't even know what that means when you say go to the public square so I I mean I've spent a long time trying to get at some of the tables I've been fortunate enough to get into some of the tables but I don't know if people know how that works what that table looks like who should they be engaging with in their community can you speak a little bit more on that yeah I mean we have Stephen Immerman here of uh, Mass Creative who which is a great sort of one-stop shop to sort of find out what's happening legislatively in the arts sector. So if you aren't part of Mass Creative's um, list serves and social media postings, please join that. Um, and Emily um, Reddick, who runs Mass Creative, she and I have been having some sort of collaborative conversations about what we can do to train the sector in, I don't know, sort of a, a crude term, but sort of advocacy 101, like, how do you connect with your local legislators and your state legislators? How do you make sure you get um, you get on their on their radar? How do you get a meeting with them on a regular basis? Are you are they on your VIP list serves? Are they um, do they know about your websites? Are you meeting with them on a regular basis? Um, in, in the legislative process and how bills and laws are passed and how the budgeting process um, happens. Uh, it, it, it can be complicated and it can be hard to understand. So hopefully we can, we can do that and we can, we can sort of build that efficacy 101. Also, you can just join our listservs and just do what Michael Bobbin and Emily Ruddick say, which is also a good thing to do. So if we say, email your legislator right now and say, we support this bill, we support this budget allocation. That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot. They need to hear from us as much as they can. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for Michael? Yes, Tony. Michael, thank you very much. I've had uh, been the recipient of many local cultural council grants. I make my living for the last 30 years as a storyteller. So I know this is not in within the, you know, the Mass Cultural Council, but it, just the whole thing with the pandemic and in schools, I had an 
in school performance in June, right before school ended, before the Delta variant came. And now with Omicron, things have just sort of dried up again. And I mean, I have a girlfriend who's a school nurse and she is just out flat. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts about artists visiting into schools and what we can do with Zoom or anything else like that? Yeah, I don't know. I still think we're way behind on innovation uh, when it comes to digital integration of um, arts consumption. And, and, you know, again, that's one of the things on January 24th you can share with us to say, hey, can there be money set aside so that either the artist can build up their own digital, digital knowledge um, equipment so that they can actually help the schools get into schools or fund the schools with digital upgrades so that they can bring artists in. Um, so we need to hear from that. But I do think that the cultural sector is a little bit behind on its integration of the digital technology into what we do. I said a lot last year that we need to look at how sports came into people's homes and the innovation around sports is kind of cooler to watch a sports event from your home because you can get, um, you know, slow-mo, instant replay, the stats and the credits on the ball players. Um, you can pause. Uh, and so what can we do in our own um, art sector to make sure that kind of thing happens? I think we'll reach more people and also be able to um, make, some, make some money from that. We have some ideas about that. <laughs> we certainly do. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're producing a, and um, developing a digital platform as part of our new website to be able to serve uh, the sector better with production support, storytelling support, and promotional support. Uh, we're calling it the Creative County Experience uh, as a platform of services, suite of services. And we've gotten some uh, Mass Office of Business Development funding um, in this last year uh, to support the you know, uh, testing of that and, and a lot of different um, innovations that we've, we've, um, we've tested out um, in the last 12 months. And so, yeah, we're just continuing to build that because we saw it as a need and, and we're excited to work with, with you and see what other kind of resources can come through for that kind of work. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, as we know that when we make advances in technology, we usually don't go back. I mean, there aren't a lot of people out there using their iPod Touch and 8-tracks, right? But you should continue to advance. So those that haven't caught up on digital technology need to spend some time learning about it, reading about it, because it, it, and it's not and or, it's not, it's not one or the other, it's going to be both, it's going to be an integration of the both. I've been reading articles saying things like non-hybrid models are going to feel like throwbacks, so if you go into an opera and there's not some sort of digital integration, it will feel like a throwback and it will become out of fashion soon. I'm reading articles that saying saying that every single artist and arts organization is going to have a streaming platform. And I, I don't know if you remember how we scoffed about websites and social media way back when they first came out. We were like, no, I'm going to keep printing brochures. But as we make advances in technology, we have to, and, and in fact, this, this industry should be the people leading it. We should be innovating as opposed to catching up. So keep going with all that. Oh, thank you, Michael. Tia. Unmuting and taking my hand down. These are all the things you have to remember on a Zoom, right? Hi, Michael. So excited to actually see you, be able to speak directly to you. This is cool. Um, I have two things. I have one is feedback um, um, as a local cultural council, former local cultural council member. Um, I work in the Lynn community with our arts and culture, and our local cultural council is the savior. We have an amazing budget. Um, but one of the things that I saw in my tenure there was that our cultural council wasn't able to be as inclusive as it needed to be. It tended to have the, the same handful of arts and culture leaders making the same decisions and being able to, within the whatever their bandwidth was, because I know everybody's so busy, only be able to promote the local cultural council to those that they know and those that were repeat grantees. Um, and I wonder if there is a way that we can create that system to be more inclusive. Um, we in a city that has over 60% of the population that speaks Spanish didn't have the resources to be able to translate the things in Spanish. And we didn't really have a table set that made anyone who was initially Latino um, feel like they belonged to it. 
I, I know that's changed a little bit because I blasted it as much as I could that we needed new members and that's changed a little, but there's, I think, some barriers to access when it talks, when we talk about the time commitment and the financial commitment that seem, when we talk about it, it seems silly, but really do create this kind of wall where I know there were some amazing people in our city, artists in our city that would have loved to participate in the cultural council specifically and help make those decisions but weren't able to um and i wonder if there's like can we financially support some of these how do we how do we take down those those barriers yeah there's a um there's a, a slight difficulty in the local cultural councils in that the way the legislation is written those local cultural councils have significant autonomy the council members are appointed by the leaders of the municipality. So we're not, we don't get any kind of approval process. The only thing we say is they have to have at least five members. Um, so, and, and so we can support them in their diversity efforts. In fact, we push them and push them and push them. We can also support them in their recruiting efforts. We push and push and push. The team that I have at Mass Cultural Council is very good about pushing them in that way. This is, I think, where your voices to your collective voices to your local cultural councils and your municipal leaders will make a difference in how that council um, does their programming and allocates their funds. They have full autonomy on how they allocate their funds. We can certainly send them notes saying your, your allocations weren't as diverse as we think it should be. But really, it's going to be—it's their decision. We can support things like if, if translations are needed. I think we probably can support that. I shouldn't—I I say think because I'm not sure necessarily how that happens. I know that for us, we provide translation services as needed. Um, but I think if that happens, have your local cultural council reach out to the program officer at Mass Cultural Council to say you have those difficulties. But I know you all probably are part of the local cultural council who have been funded by those but your collective voices to the municipalities and to the councils will make a big difference in how they build their councils and how they allocate their resources. Mina is incredibly amazing and helpful and so great. And she has definitely held everyone's hand through all of it. I think maybe more of what I'm wondering is if part of the cultural cultural council, the, the applicants, especially in Lynn, and I don't wanna set the record wrong, we fund pretty much every single project. Um, it may be at a small percent, but we fund every project. So there's not, necessarily a diversity thing. I would just like to see more voices um, in charge of that or at that table. And like I said, I think that there's, I know we have like admin fees and things. Um, is there something that can be, and I know this is the tough part, a stipend included in there saying, hey, you're taking these eight meetings. We know it's taking time out of your day, but we appreciate your voice because you're a BIPOC member of the community and underserved and we need to support that, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. So again, the local cultural councils have pretty pretty much autonomy in how they spend the money. I think most of the money has to go out to grants, but I think each cultural council has a certain allocation they can use for administrative purposes. So if they're using the money to, if they're if they're using money for recruitment purposes, that's really up, up to them to do that's that. Awesome. If they, yeah, if mm -hmm. they want to fund someone to help them recruit, then I think they have the full autonomy to make those decisions. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, other questions? Maybe time for one more before we um, let Michael go and open it up for the group. Come on, you guys aren't shy. <laughs> 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 we have some municipal leaders here. Um, I see a planner. I see a town planner. <laughs> Is there anything from the municipal point of view that you have? questions about our concerns or anything else at this point that that Michael can lend a voice to. One thing I will say is that uh, if I'm not mistaken that each um, city and town was allocated uh, American Rescue Plan money as yeah. well as the state and so collectively if you aren't advocating to get some of that money uh, you should. Yeah. I don't know if all the towns have spent their money, if they had spent all their money where you are, but it's it, it, they haven't need to meet with your town manager and your mayor collectively and say, hey, the art sector in our, in our region needs some of that money to go to the art sector. I do know that like Worcester, they got $4.5 million from the town manager um, for the arts and culture sector. Um, 
but they were very, very good about collective impact and getting their voices heard to get some of that money. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, we've been wondering about that. There's such a range of uh, experiences, you know, <laughs> from town to town, as far as that goes, as far as community engagement goes and input and all of that. It's, um, you know, it's like this big black hole for many communities, unfortunately. Yeah, and Erin Williams is really, really generous with her time. So if you ever wanted to get her on a phone call to see what kind of action she took to help to help convince the town to give them money, she, I'm sure she would give you time. That's a great idea. I think we'll yeah. invite her in uh, to one of these forums. Karen, I didn't know if you were calling me out. This is Starlene Wynn. I'm the because um, there's another planner on here too that I see, but um, I'm the planning director for the city of Beverly. Um, I don't. Uh, that was actually really helpful information and, and good to point out and note that I will follow up with our ARPA director as well as our mayor to see where we stand um, from an arts art and culture perspective and funding. But you know, we've been really grateful for the the support from the Mass Cultural Council in Beverly um, with our arts district and the CDI grants that we've gotten the last few years and just recently were awarded another one. So I think, um, you know, we have a lot of um, irons in the fire, I guess, um, in regards to arts and culture. And we're still constantly trying to, you know, grow Beverly as a cultural community and support our artists and, that, you know, any work we can do with MCC. Um, is just really much appreciated, but I feel like the relationship has been strong. We are, um, I'm sad to hear that Luis is moving on, but hopefully there'll be somebody just as equally great to, um, to fill his position and continue to support municipalities and the, the communication that he has uh, created amongst uh, municipalities with arts districts has been really great too. Yeah, we're sad about Luis too. I'm going to miss him. Um, but he's he's actually doing work in my hometown. So I live in Cambridge. So I could see him a lot. Uh, but you have a great thing going out there in Beverly. Joe has brought me out there a couple of times. I've just enjoyed so much time. And I snuck in there. I didn't tell anyone, but I snuck in there when my mom came to visit after Thanksgiving. We drove through and walked around a little bit. Um, but it's a really, really beautiful town. And there's a lot of money right now. I mean, the, 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 the state had a massive surplus plus all the ARPA money. And then there's also gonna be all this infrastructure money coming in too. I'm not sure how much of that can support the arts and cultural sector, but there, there might be. So it's, it's a lot of richness in the municipal municipalities and in the, um, the state legislation. So push, talk, meet with your legislators, meet with them on a regular basis, tell them what you need and hopefully they'll, they'll make some decisions. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Michael. Uh, John, last question. We need to. Yeah. I saw Linda's hand too. I, I can take oh, two sorry. more. Okay. Yeah, I can take two more. Yeah. Okay. Linda. Sorry, I thought John was going first. Hi, I'm Linda Ross Gerard. I live in Salem and uh, have been involved uh, somewhat here and passed um, with the Salem Theater Company that is. Uh, I guess dissolved maybe five, four or five years ago. I also teach at Tufts University. So I feel like I know a lot of the same people um, that you know with Maurice Parent and, and uh, I'm uh, involved in, in that as well. So I'm interested in, how, since there is all of this money and over the last decade, um, as you know, we've seen uh, small to medium sized theater companies uh, go away and not, not make it, um, you know, it, it strikes me that we are dealing with each town trying to do smaller initiatives, but is there some um, thought of uh, creating an effort to actually, for example, creating a theater company that is funded, that, you know, is not just Salem, is not just Beverly, but um, how do we use this money in kind of a bigger picture way um, because I think, as you know, it's incredibly challenging to maintain a theater company um, and uh, frequently takes an invested board and uh, leadership group. Uh, so when we mount kind of smaller projects in different venues, it's exciting. And there's so much interest in that in Salem and actually so many theater artists on the North Shore. Um, but the structure of a building and funding and, you know, uh, that's so huge. And that feel, it feels like such a loss to our community, um, even though that the organization that existed here in Salem was very small. 
um, but it was something that really connected to the community. Yeah, I don't know what Mass Cultural Council can do because most of our programming is 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 just funding. But if you and I want to like have coffee and talk about what I've learned as a person who's run a bunch of theaters for 20 years, I'm happy to sit down and tell you some of the things I've done that were successful. Um, and then the other thing too is 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 find a way to support more small and mid-sized organizations. I'm hoping to elevate to our, um, as a focus area for our strategic plan, which we'll be designing in, in the fall, starting in the fall. So stay tuned for that, but feel free to reach out okay. and you and I can sort of sit down and have a conversation. Great, I, I was also actually gonna ask just for information about um, internships with Mass Cultural Council. Um, I'm, I know that there's a lot of tough students, um, but and also Salem State students that potentially are really interested in these issues of community engagement, arts, et cetera. Yeah, we're a little slammed right now. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so the staff has put a put a kibosh on uh, internships, Inter but okay. maybe in the future we can bring it back. Okay. Awesome. John. Um, all right. So in this kind of ties in a little bit with Linda said, because I've watched theater companies in Salem struggle as well and go away and it's depressing and it's sad. It's my mind that Salem doesn't have a namesake theater company right now, considering it's Salem. Um, so that is definitely something, Linda, if you go forward with that, you know, keep us in our group in the in the back of your head too, because I'd love to see that happen. Um, but I'm wondering, the the space is very complicated where a lot of what you're talking about is very nonprofit focused and very nonprofit heavy. And, you know, if you think about the organizations like a theater company, uh, <laughs> the nonprofit side of things, but then there's also all the workers that are the freelancers and the gig workers and the contractors. And they're kind of don't know where to go to talk to people. They don't know where to go to get support. You know, there was the struggle with getting them unemployment, their struggle with they don't qualify for most of the small business grants. Um, I happen to be part of the economic development task force and the ARPA task force in Salem, and we can't seem to get any understanding of how to support this one group of people, which if you look at the scope of freelancers and contractors in the artistic world, it's huge. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, how does Mass Cultural approach these, these people? And how can we all do a better job as we advocate for these people? And I, I'm very connected with Emily, and I'll definitely have that conversation more. But I see a lot of organizations getting money. And, you know, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, seeing tourism get so much money, but it doesn't trickle down to the people actually doing the work. And so what, what can we do a little bit better about that? Yeah, one of the things I just started talking to my staff about, I don't know if you noticed, but we, for our individuals, we went from 75 grants to 150 grants. We doubled it. I just said to them, I want to double it again and keep doubling it. Um, so we have to look at what, what we need to make that happen. Um, so keep an eye on that. The, and, and then the, the, the other area where I'm doing a lot of research now as we start planning for our strategic planning process is that I think that we need to elevate artist infrastructure or cultural worker infrastructure as a strategic focus area to see what we can do for, I don't know, advocate for housing, for food insecurities, for workforce development, to see if there are programs. And also if we can advocate for legislation to support this. One of the things I've been saying to legislators is that we can't fix all the problems by throwing money at it. Some of this has to become policy. Um, for instance, can developers be required to include um, artist housing in their development project? or studio space. Um, I will tell you a, a brief little story that um, at, when I was running New, Rep New Repertory Theater in Watertown, um, things were, we were struggling. We had some debt that we needed to pay off. Um, our um, lease with our office was coming up and I had done a lot of work to build relationships. I think people do business with people they know. So most of the time I'm trying to get away from my desk to meet the people in the community that are making decisions. So I had already built up a really good relationship with the town manager. When our lease was coming up, I was like, I can't afford to do this lease, which was about $48,000 for the office space. And because he and I had already talked and built a relationship and I met him several times, I called him one day and he said, 
Well, actually, I just finished signing a deal with a developer who um, convinced us to take a space that was deemed for commercial property. And he convinced us that it wasn't a good use for that space because there was a new development that had been built. Can I use it for something else? And the city said, yes, you can, but you have to do something nice for a nonprofit. So we got 1,500 square feet of space for $5,000 for the year. So I went from a $48,000 bill to a $5,000 bill because I built a relationship with the town manager. So people do business with people they know. Again, you know, if you and others want to get together and talk about like how we can, if you and Linda want to get together, talk about a theater company that we can form together or how we can come up with some sort of we work type of organization that supports several organizations. I think all this kind of innovation needs to be considered. Space is going to be vulnerable for the next five to 10 years. Um, so those that have space, maybe you can open your doors up for smaller organizations to be housed in your space. You can relook at your business model and become, become a joint venture. There are all kinds of things you can do, but now is the time to double down on innovation and creativity. Yeah, one of the spaces that I've seen some decent movement in that is people that become friendly with um, cannabis businesses early on because the community benefits agreement, if that can go to creative spaces even better and i feel like that that makes a lot of sense that that system feeds into itself as well so yeah yeah but this I, is again why it's important to stay connected to what's happening in your lawmakers offices yeah so thank I you probably i should probably run i think okay. before you end, before you end your meeting you should require <laughs> carolyn cole to sing your song <laughs> we will she's, do that she's we'll such a good, good singer <laughs> okay friends great to see you we're looking forward to thank seeing you, you on the 24th okay take care thank you bye-bye okay. all right that was awesome <laughs> he's so good we're so lucky to have him and so accessible you know he put his um <coughs> contact info in the chat so call him up um so let's um, open it up to feedback, comments, and your own agenda, uh, your own, you know, what's happening. Um, any news, any challenges, any innovative solutions, anything you want to know from us uh, at Creative County? Um, Karen, Karen? Hi, Steve. Good morning, I think in Salem News, it's finally public that the Cabot is opening a comedy club at Nine Wallace for new and emerging um, comedians, 150 seats. And hopefully, uh, notwithstanding COVID, it'll be operating in March as a new entertainment and a gathering community uh, in downtown Beverly. That's exactly the kind of news we need, given that so many places are stopping their music and, you know, just doubling down on this on this um, virus. So thank you, Steve. That's great news. And it's a great space. Um, that's going to be wonderful. Really wonderful. Um, so who else has news, challenges, feedback, questions? Donna. Hi, good morning. Um, I've got a couple questions and just want to get some feedback from people. Um, I'm with the Salisbury Cultural Council and we have this arts and cultural initiative that we've kicked off a few months ago when we're creating a survey. We have created actually a template for a survey um, to send out broadly in the community about um, arts and culture in Salisbury because uh, the town is currently undergoing a um, master planning and we are going to be included in that um, when that's completed. So I wanna know what people use for surveys, what they found to be the best platform. Um, I currently have it in Survey Planet. I had in the past used is it you know, monkey survey, survey monkey, whichever one that is. And there seems to be changes in the way they operate. So I went to survey planet, but we're doing a free platform, of course. And there's a lot of limitations to it of how you can pose the questions and get results. So I'm just curious if anyone's been doing surveys and what platform they may have used. 
We use SurveyMonkey and Google Forms, uh, but anyone else? Google Forms is a great free option. Um, my company uses Typeform because it's really customizable and funky. Um, that's that's what we use, but it's not great. Erin? Um, Donna, you may want to also um, contact the town or um, the vendor who is working with the town because there may be some funding available to purchase um, services. We use SurveyMonkey, but we I'm a I'm a town planner in Reading, but often with master planning processes and involving stakeholders, there tends to be a little bit of funding available for um, paid survey services. We use SurveyMonkey, um, a paid version of it. Um, we like how the data um, is analyzed and the graphics that are associated with that. Um, but there are other, I want to just say that there may be some funding opportunities. So you don't have to be um, analyzing your data on the back end by hand and really slogging through that. You might be able to get more technical assistance from your community. Okay, I think I did, the town had sent out um, a survey planet because I was always using survey monkey. And so I asked them, do you have a paid? I thought they may since they were using it. And they said, no, we're just using the free option because you can't like branch questions if you don't pay for it. So, I mean, there's these little things. Um, I guess there's really not, maybe we are using the better ones that are out there. Um, so I just wanted to check to see, thank you. Thanks, um, yeah. And I've got one more situation that kind of I just saw come through. Um, I've been on the Arts Council, Arts Council for a few years and also engaged in the art stroll events, you know, volunteering and working on that in Salisbury days we do here. And the art stroll has been uh, being implemented for like eight years. I mean, well before I was here. And it sort of has grown and developed and we've moved to a different location last year. And that's just a little bit like of a background history, but I saw an email come through from the person who's at the Parks and Recs and they're having a meeting on Tuesday, which I'll be attending, um, that the art stroll is merging into this fairy gnome walk, discovery walk, which they've done at Pentacle Farms here, it's another site. And so I asked, is this like to partner with them or is this in merging it or is it going to all be one? And they said, we're going to make it, it's all one. So Art Stroll, as it has been known, and in fact, we even went from Art Stroll to Art Stroll Festival because it got that much more interactive for people and kids. So they're merging it. And so Art Stroll is, I guess it sounds like disappearing and it's going to be this one event, which I can't say I have a lot of information around because I'll be going Tuesday, but I'm a little concerned and I don't know how to push back or what to do about that um, being uh, the outcome of what they wanna do in the town because our surveys and what we're trying to do here is encourage and have more arts and cultural events. So, I'm a little disturbed that they're removing a June art stroll and putting it into combining it with this April event. And I don't know how to respond to that or what going to that meeting because I'm not happy. I'm really bothered by it. And I don't really know their reasoning behind it. So I just want to see if anyone had any ideas of how a good way would be to push back and try to remain, get them to rethink not having art stroll. My, my immediate reaction, Donna, is that you've been building, putting together building blocks there for the last year or two now for toward doing a cultural plan and you've got some allies and you're building and your allyship one at a time. Uh, to support that effort to, so that the cultural plan in Salisbury can inform the master plan. And so I'm not sure if the people who are, whoever is behind this merger that you're talking about are aware of what you're doing. I'm just, you know, I would just come at it as a, you know, open informational, like folks, this is what, you know, this is what we've been trying to build and this is why we're building it. And can we include this, you know, iteration of the art stroll into 
the overall planning process, you know, include them rather than be afraid of what they're maybe doing. I'm not sure. That's just my take. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, anybody else have any feedback or, or advice for Jonna at this point? Uh, I would piggyback on that in that it's about collective action. Yeah. And so it's about finding your partners and your relationships and gathering people together and committing to together trying to make an impact with um, with a louder common voice and so it, it's about collective advocacy and engagement yeah yeah great and I'd, I'd also yeah. I'd also had to make sure that as Michael said you're in the right room yeah. that you that you attend any meeting that you can as much as it's a hassle to attend meetings but make sure that anybody who supports you is at that meeting it makes a huge difference yeah Mm. All right, another couple of questions here. Um, I'm hoping that's helpful, Donna. Um, so, Terry? Oh, hi, thanks. Um, Karen, this is for you and John, actually. I'm interested in more in learning more about what you said about uh, when you were talking to Michael about ECCF and the digital platform tools that you're creating. I'm familiar with the new website. John helped me with it a little bit. <laughs> um, but uh, we recently, in December, had our first live concert again after two years. Um, and uh, for the first time, we live streamed it. And I found a, a great uh, videographer who did that for us. But I'm having trouble like knowing, having the tools to have people access that, like not on YouTube with the ads and how to monetize it and how to, as Michael said, you know, having this hybrid system where you have live and you have live stream yeah. simultaneously. It, was, it worked out great, but it's kind of clunky mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for us. So what can you help us with? <laughs> Uh, John, I don't know if you want to respond to that. Yeah, I would say send us that information in email and stay tuned because we're working on that specific thing. It's just not ready to go live yet. Um, we are currently working on uh, an experiment with a, you know, a, a large platform to organizations like yourself to do digital distribution. Um, whether it's subscription based, whether it's, you know, a one off um, and hopefully having multiple uh, opportunities for organizations to do it in whatever way fits your organization. Um, as you can probably tell by talking to all of us on a regular basis, every organization does their things a little differently slightly little tweaks. This is how they like it. This is how someone else likes it. So what we've been trying to find is the most inclusive platform and inclusive process that we could have so that it kind of works for everyone with maybe some minor variation changes. Um, but exactly what you're describing and exactly what Michael had said is what the Creative County experience is, is going to be for. Um, with innovation comes, this isn't quick. <laughs> so Aaron and I and the team have actively been working on specifically what you're talking about for months. Um, and, and the website is a little tease of what's to come and the gateway to all of this stuff in the future. So I would send us an email with exactly everything okay. you just on that radar of to both you and Karen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yep. and, and we've been providing some technical assistance ad hoc to folks around the county uh, with specific questions. So it may be being able to get on a call with you, you know, and talking for a half an hour and just working out some some things, you know, in real time that way. So great, thank you. You're welcome, Scott. Hi. Good morning. Um, don't have any spotlight playhouse news at the moment. We're still on this in this sort of hiatus period, and I hope hope to have news in the next couple of months. But I wanted to respond to the first part of Donna's question about forms and, and surveys. And it's kind of a more general answer than that, but it might serve the needs for, for some folks. And that is Google makes the their entire suite of products uh, available at no cost for nonprofits. 
In fact, I'll, I'll put a. Hey, Scott, you muted yourself by accident. That's curious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put a link in the chat here. Um, the, the suite is available for uh, at, at, at no cost. And for example, at Spotlight, we have uh, you know, gobs of Google Drive storage and dozens of email accounts, and, and it's, all, it's all free. That includes forms. There are some YouTube benefits. I have not explored those particularly, but it is, um, it's something to take advantage of if, if you are involved with a 501c3 nonprofit. Thank you, Scott. Um, and I dropped in the in the chat. I dropped a link to uh, Essex National Heritage Partnership grants. Um, they have funded stuff like you know premium versions of software to support cultural whatever. Um, so that might be something you want to look at too. And you can find the link to that in the chat. Um, and it, that it's they, also oh, go ahead. Go ahead oh, sorry, it, it it's also worth calling the vendor. Uh, you yeah. know, if you have a particular, you know, whether it's SurveyMonkey or somebody else, the bigger the companies get, the less likelihood, perhaps. But there are a lot of companies that make really intriguing products that they're willing to share with with nonprofits. If you if you call them and make a case, you sometimes have to work through two or three levels of of salespeople to get to somebody who cares. But it's 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 possible. We've had some success with that too. Thanks, Scott. Bobby, hi. Hi, how are you? So um, uh, as, a, as a business owner, I am a portrait artist, but as a committee member in the community, I am involved in the Salem Film Fest. Um, the Salem Film Fest 2022 is happening both, it's a hybrid this year, it is happening in person, fingers crossed, um, as well as virtual. Uh, it's going to be from March 24th to April 3rd with the, a four-day weekend of in-person screenings at the Cabot, at Cinema Salem, at PBD Essex, um, and one screening, I believe, at Endicott College. Uh, one of the reasons why I bring it up is that we are going to, we are still looking for business sponsors and community partners. Uh, business sponsors, um, even though I am a committee member on both um, the sponsorship, community partners, and website, I also actually pay to be a business sponsor because I, I love being in front of that audience. Um, so for $250, I get to have my logo associated with one of the films. Um, I will mention that it is a 100% documentary film fest. It's fascinating. The topics are very broad, wide, engaging, um, and we have topics for everything from um, social uh, um, unrest to environmental to artists um, and musician documentaries. We do not have the lineup yet, um, but um, we do have an opportunity to pair you with the, with the appropriate film. Uh, for community partners, um, that is for nonprofits. If you'd like to sponsor us, it's kind of a win-win. We don't charge you. We pair you with a film that mirrors your cause. And um, as long as you promote us to your audience, um, we promote you um, to our audience. So it's a win-win. Um, so that is an option for nonprofits. I'll throw a link in the chat uh, for that. Um, it, for business sponsors, um, it's $250 if you sign up by this Saturday, the 15th. Um, after that, it is 300 and you get to choose um, your um, one film that you want to be associated with. Um, and so once again, uh, it's going to be in person, um, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, God willing, <laughs> or in person, it'll be um, the weekend of March 24th to 27th, uh, followed by um, a virtual, um, you know, the balance of that week from the 28th through the fourth uh, th through April 3rd. Sorry, I hope I, I'm getting the dates correct. Um, let me just double check that. Yes, yeah, so the, the weekend from Thursday to, to Sunday, the 24th, to 27th, and then virtual from the 28th of um, March through Friday, April 4th. Um, and what else was I going to say? Um, it, it's we're expecting 20 feature length um, documentary films. The lineup will be released uh, about a month before the screenings begin. And I'm pretty excited about it. I've, I've been a huge fan and a sponsor and a committee member. So hopefully you can all join us either in person or 
uh, virtually or through sponsorship. Thanks. Thank you, Bobby. Uh, let's see, Christina. Hi, as I say, I'm new here, um, but I did want to uh, just throw out that, that, that seems like this is the appropriate place to promote our uh, latest production. Uh, we have uh, currently in rehearsal for Arcadia uh, at Castle Hill. I'm going to go ahead and put the um, uh, link to tickets here in the um, uh, chat. There it goes. Um, we do, they were very small um, house. <laughs> we do uh, uh, perform in the great house at Castle Hill, um, which sounds ridiculous then to say we have a very small house, but that we can only seat 60 at a time, especially in COVID times. We are planning on going um, absolutely um, uh, in person and uh, we'll restrict the, the size of the audience and of course require uh, all the uh, immunization and, and all that. Um, so I hope that uh, you'll uh, join us and we'll spread the word and um, uh, thank you for the time. <laughs>